um, President, fellows, guests. Um, for over 50 years, and especially in the last two decades, uh, the antiquaries have very successfully welcomed thousands of visitors to Kelmscott Manor. However, ever since taking over ownership of the manor in the 1960s, the Society has curated and publicised the house and its uh, uh, collection of artefacts in a way that differs very little from the presentation of historic houses by the National Trust, English Heritage, or by other institutions and private owners. This being the case, it begs the following question, as often asked by fellows of the society as by anybody else. Why does the Society of Antiquaries continue to own and maintain this site when the job it currently does might be done equally well by others? The Kelscott project has been specifically designed to respond to that question from an essentially one-dimensional approach, we hope to uh, make Kelscott Manor and its experience something multi-dimensional, as I hope to show. This will transform the visitor's experience from simply seeing a somewhat static house museum, in effect a shrine to Morris and his family, to instead participating in a working exposition of the Society's own dynamic engagement with the past. This takes as its starting point the very reasons why Morris himself loved the house and its setting. Morris would probably have been disappointed by the over-reverential response among today's vis visitors that is engendered by the current presentation of Kelscott Manor. When he first came to live there in 1871, he was drawn to the place by its unpretentious antiquity and rural tranquility. The vernacular architecture of the manor did much to enlarge his historical perspective. It embodied a rich continuity of building traditions that went back to the Middle Ages. And these traditions were a reasonable and also a very beautiful response to the local environment expressed in the locally quarried stone masonry or the timber roof construction from elm trees that once grew abundantly alongside the house. Whilst in formal terms the manor is not Gothic, its craftsmanship nonetheless had everything that Morris's mentor John Ruskin identified as constituting the nature of Gothic. Understanding and appreciating Kelscott Manor was a formative influence upon Morris's philosophy of building conservation. In fact, the principles of which still underpin the modern approach to preserving the historic man-made environment are fundamentally tied up with Morris's uh, experience of Kelscott Manor. In Morris's imagination, his quarter century of living at the house, albeit for only parts of each year, vividly connected him to an organic historical continuum that resonated with him deeply. He spoke of himself and his family haunting the manor's rooms, as if their presence in it was fleeting and yet would also somehow be perennial. In his best-known literary work, the novel, the utopian novel, News From Nowhere, the manor and the village of Kelmscott are movingly characterised. More than just a setting, they symbolise, in the transformed society of the future, the best of human creativity in harmony with the natural environment. As an antiquary, and of course Morris was elected to our society in the 1890s, Morris had a profound interest in his predecessors at the manor, and indeed in those who had dwelled on the site long before 1600 when the existing house was built. And he thought it inconceivable that such a place should not continue to delight and inspire people. Throughout William Morris's time at Kelmscott and subsequently well into the early 20th century, Kelmscott Manor was an active farmstead. The barns and yard were in daily use by one of the local farmers. Morris himself frequently commented on the daily economy of agricultural work that he observed and which he was, in which he was sometimes involved. Um, for example, rescuing stray ducklings on one occasion. He also found endless inspiration in the landscape and natural life of Kelmscott. 
His letters, written from the manor, invariably mention local, mention local plants, trees and birds, and his acute observation of nature lies at the heart of his designs for textiles, wallpapers, and the intricate decorations of his Kelmscott Press books. The Kelmscott project, therefore, adopts a holistic approach, encompassing not only the manor house, but all the outbuildings and garden, and the whole surrounding landscape. Its interpretation of the site and its repair and conservation of the buildings will emphasize a de deeper historical view of the manor than hitherto, and its agricultural buildings and their functions. It will include research into previous, i.e. pre-Morris generations of occupants, as well as archeological investigation of the whole site. Since the village's buildings, except the church, all post-date 1600, it will pose the question, where is medieval and indeed prehistoric Kelmscott? It will make appropriate use of the barns for learning activities for all age groups, examining the impact of the local environment on human activity from prehistory onwards. And I should add that recently we've begun uh, an important collaboration with Newcastle University, which will research how children and young people, uh, the potential antiquaries of the future, engage with the past. An exhibition program will use the Manor's reserve collection for in-depth examination of Morris's work and the history of the site. Other exhibitions, curated by fellows, will be drawn from the Society's own extensive collections here at Burlington House. Just one example, brass rubbings or, for example, archaeological material, as well as loans from other relevant institutions. An artist-in-residence scheme will explore the inspiration of this special place for contemporary visual artists and crafts workers, and could also include writers and musicians whose work could be publicly performed on site. Within the manor itself, learning resources will be available in what's known as the cheese room on the first floor for visitors to study aspects of the collection and the buildings, etc., in greater depth. The manor's attics, perhaps one of the most evocative spaces in the whole building, will be used where appropriate for on-site conservation of art artifacts from the uh, manor's own collections and for displays about modern conservation techniques and methodology. That's a summary of uh, the vision that we have for the project. You'll certainly hear more detail of how that's going to be implemented in uh, Paul Richard's um, talk after mine. Um, I'll now show you some pictures. Um, I mentioned May Morris. We have Kelmscott Manor because May Morris, William's daughter, um, looked after it uh, throughout her lifetime and, uh, as many of you will know, bequeathed it to Oxford University, who um, eventually passed it to the society in the 1960s. You see a watercolour by May, top left, of her, her sister Jenny and their mother Jane in the tapestry room. Uh, bottom left is May, again in the tapestry room, but in 1909, um, looking through the proofs of the collected works of her father, um, which she edited with some splendid essays, the marvellous collection of biographical essays. And on the left, you see May in the 1930s, around the time that she made her arrangements for <laughs> made her arrangements for um, leaving the house to Oxford. Uh, those arrangements, as many of you will know, um, entail keeping the house pretty well exactly as it had been in her lifetime and not introducing any modern um, conveniences. Um, that proved completely untenable, and uh, it was partly for that reason that Oxford passed on the, uh, the building to the society as residuary legatee of the Morris estate. Of course, the house has never been, as May Morris uh, uh, liked to think of it, um, it has never been the house in which William Morris lived. Um, uh, visitors now do not see it as Morris saw it. It's far more 
elaborately furnished than it was in Morris's time. And one of the challenges that we face is to try and, in a sense, rationalize this and come up with a vision for the interpretation of the house and display of the house, which will sort out some of what have become sort of slightly anomalous things. The fact that the house is full of uh, artifacts, which of course our visitors flock to see, um, uh, but which belong to other houses in Morris's life and other periods of Morris's life. Um, just two examples, embroidery um, by, designed by Morris and worked by uh, Jane Morris's sister Bessie Burden uh, on the left, and of course the Rossetti portrait, the blue silk dress. Neither of these were at Kelmscott in uh, Morris's time. They were in the houses in London that the Morris family occupied. Um, other contents have been there since the 1870s, um, including an important collection of works of art um, left there by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Uh, there's the Bruegel the Younger Spring painting, uh, top left, uh, which was, of course, lent to the important Bruegel exhibition in Bath um, earlier in the year. And on the right, these, uh, one of a pair of fascinating paintings, recently researched, depicting Lisbon um, in the, uh, around 1600. And a lot of research has been done on those. They're an important historical document. Um, and we don't have an enormous amount of evidence for how the, the, the manor looked in Morris's lifetime. The best surviving evidence are the photographs that Frederick Evans took. Frederick Evans, the great architectural photographer, who went there in 1896, when Morris is still alive, and um, then just after his death in 1897. And we can assume that both those sets of photographs show the house uh, insofar as uh, Evans documented it, and he didn't by any means photograph every room, um, they do show um, how the house looked when Morris was there. Um, at the top, you see the garden hall. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with, with the manor. Um, and bottom left, you see the hall as it was in Morris's time. Um, the doorway, which in the upper photograph would be just to the left of that row of Burne Jones drawings, um, the doorway on the bottom left, as you see, is butting up to a partition that extends um, and, in fact, covers up the area which is at present now opened up and has the settle, which was made in 1859 by Philip Webb and, again, was in the London houses and was never in uh, Kelmscott in Morris's lifetime. Uh, the Chinese chairs, you can recognize, were there. Um, interestingly, the photograph, Reading Evans' photograph, uh, shows the green paintwork, which was removed in the 1960s around the um, door frame, and also one of the Red House very early artifacts, which was at Kelmscott in Morris's time which is the If I Can Embroidery, the very first, or one of the very first surviving Morris embroideries. Um, the, uh, the very successful uh, repair and uh, conservation that was carried out in the 1960s by um, Insul Associates under Peter Locke, the architect, um, saved the house, which would otherwise almost certainly have collapsed within a, a, a few years because of huge structural problems and years of neglect. Um, but as part of that, decisions were made which need looking at again, I think. Uh, one of them, for example, was to remove the overmantel, the green timber overmantel, almost certainly designed by Philip Webb, which you see in the Evans photograph on the left, and which you see Paul, who's going to be talking after me on the right, um, supervising the repositioning experimentally of that uh, overmantel, which we hope to restore to the green room. Um, the stairs, um, they were green until uh, probably the 1940s when the, um, when the paint was stripped off them. It seems likely that they were painted um, originally in the 1600s. Um, so do we decide to put back uh, that paintwork uh, which would have been probably the same sort of colour as the green shown in the Evans photo of the garden hall. 
Um, many of you will be aware that uh, the fireplace in the old hall, top left, um, was never seen by Morris. That was actually covered by a much later uh, fireplace. And it's, uh, I think, one of the decisions that was absolutely right when the work in the 1960s was done to leave that original fireplace, the uh, original Tudor fireplace, exposed. Morris himself would have loved it, I'm sure. Um, the tapestry room. Well, I show the tapestries on the right. These have, again, recent research has been done on these. And we now think that they're probably from Audenard or Oudenard um, in, uh, uh, in Belgium and uh, are from the 1600s. They were arranged completely differently in Morris's time. And as I mentioned about the garden hall, there was originally a closet in the tapestry room and the tapestry went across the partition that divided that closet from the main room. Um, whether we rearrange the tapestries to bring them back to something like their arrangement in Morris's time and indeed in Rossetti's time, because Rossetti used, when he was in the house in the 1870s, used that closet as a studio. This is one of the questions we'll be addressing. And bottom left, again, on the Frederick Evans photos, you'll see quite a lot of furniture was got rid of. Now, some of this was got rid of in the 1930s. But some, I believe, was later got rid of by the antiquaries. And I do fear that it might have included some of this Georgian furniture, which was almost certainly Morris family relics, um, belonging either to Morris's uh, father's family or the Shelton family, his mother's family. Um, and it's interesting to see that the house was furnished not with Morris's own chairs, necessarily, some of the rooms were, but that he had these family heirlooms in the... Uh, uh, we know that William Morris's father's desk was at Kelmscott, and that was sold in the 1930s. So there's quite a lot of missing furniture, which will be good to possibly track down, although we're, we're not eager to fill up the rooms again. They already have a, a lot of furnishings. The attics. Um, one of the things when I first became honorary curator was that I did find that the attics, as they used to be, were full of interesting exhibits of Morris textiles and, and other uh, artifacts by Morris, but I felt that this increasingly gave this sort of museum atmosphere to the place. There are plenty of other museums that display Morris in a proper museum context, not least William Morris Gallery. Um, and it, by showing these artifacts, you were losing the simplicity, the purity of the space that's so evident in the famous Evans photo here. So um, actually we have got rid of the carpet. The carpet, in fact, I think was from Burlington House. So it's come back to Burlington House, I think. Um, uh, so there's no doubt, Kelmscott uh, sometimes was regarded as a bit of a dump for things from here. Um, on the other hand, the, the sofa that's out in the hall um, came from Kelmscott Manor. Uh, out in the hall outside there. So, so there's been a weird sort of interchange between the two places. Um, some beautiful uh, drone taken uh, views of the manor um, and the EH News famous bird's eye view done in the 1890s, top left. Uh, and I show these because it does give an idea of the extent of the property. Uh, there's the house, and hitherto, as I said, emphasis has always been on the house and its contents. But we have all these magnificent barns, more or less contemporary, most of them, with the house itself, so from the 1600s. Wonderful spaces, which we have certainly not been exploiting to the full, uh, apart from, I'd say, in our, in our catering function. Uh, the stables block uh, has been used for um, uh, the very successful restaurant we had there. Um, and the granary at the back um, is our also very successful shop. But we've really done nothing much with the great South Barn, which is the barn on the left of the picture, at the bottom of the picture. Um, and um, these spaces we certainly should be making more of, both historically and um, in terms of enjoyment of the spaces themselves. And just to remind you that this was a very successful 
uh, farm throughout Morris's lifetime and throughout much of May Morris's lifetime, it hosted um, a prize-winning dairy herd, Mr. Hobbs the farmer. The Hobbs family had been uh, Morris's landlords, um, operated this farm well into the 20th century, and uh, here is the spotless the 31st, bred by R. W. Hobbs and Sons. Um, and there was also a fine um, flock of sheep as well, Oxford sheep. We, um, we need to make more of that. The fact that there is this long continuity of an agricultural economy at Kelmscott, which relates directly to the agricultural economy of the whole area. And we do nothing about that at present. And that's something that we should be telling people about, and which is a way of people to, uh, the people who access the site, who may perhaps not be particularly interested in William Morris. William Morris himself, however, was certainly interested in all these things. He loved to see the animals, he loved to see the activity of the farm, and so did May Morris, so we should reflect that. Um, the garden, of course, was tremendously important, and the whole environment of Kelmscott, as I mentioned, as a huge source for Morris's ideas for pattern. The elm trees, um, now sadly gone, but you see in Evans's view on the left, and the rook nest, which is still in the current trees, so that the descendants of the rooks that uh, cawed all the time and made their parliament noise, as uh, William Morris called it, um, uh, though the descendants of those rooks are still at Kelmscott, so that's another nice continuity. The garden, of course, a constant inspiration, and you all know the story of Strawberry Thief and the birds that uh, were constantly taking the fruit from Morris's garden, uh, but he forbade the gardener from shooting them, and it inspired uh, one of his most famous patterns. Um, and uh, here, just to show that those patterns are not something that we just love in this country, um, Medway, uh, or sometimes known as Garden Tulip on the left, one of Morris's patterns, and here worn by Gustav Klimt's uh, mistress, Emily Fleurger, uh, in a dress designed by Josef Hoffmann. So Morris it was, by the 1900s, a tremendously sophisticated figure for the European avant-garde, uh, as well as everything we think of him as in this country. Um, the landscape, of course, the inspiration directly for patterns like Willow. Um, and the Thames is such a feature. The Thames really defines the landscape and defines the whole economy of Kelmscott going back to prehistory. So that's, again, something we need to do more about. Uh, the buildings all around, Great Coxwell Barn, Evans's photograph on the right, and, of course, the splendid church at uh, St George's in Kelmscott. Um, not much overtouched by Victorian restoration, and unusually with um, its, uh, some of its original stained glass, the patron saint St. George, from the mid 15th century. And uh, roundabout, of course, I mentioned the impact of Morris's ideas um, uh, in the creation of sighted protection age buildings. Uh, before and after top left uh, St Albans Abbey, that's what Morris was protesting against, uh, Lord Grimthorpe's horrific sort of disnification of the West End of St Albans, and uh, Inglesham Church right near Kelmscott, which he very lovingly supervised the conservation of through the SPAB. And I think my final slide, the wider landscape and the prehistory, the deep history of this whole area, Whitton and Clumps, uh, top left, and of course the White Horse, where we do have a direct connection with the White Horse because Philip Webb, who built the memorial cottages at Kelmscott, his ashes were scattered on the White Horse at Uppington. So I hope that gives a little summary, and I'm sure um, Paul will give you a lot more detail. Thank you and good evening. Is the mic okay? <coughs> Showing again the picture that Peter showed, this is going to happen a little bit, I think. Um, this is the new 
engraving from the 1890s, so the same decade that Morris died. What's remarkable, I think, in many ways, is that the buildings are almost exactly the same. Hardly anything has changed. We've got this view with the foreshortened farmyard in the corner there. And in the bottom left, there is a building which is a um, very simple framed thatched buyer for the, for the cattle in the farmyard. That is only a base now, the building's gone. But otherwise, the whole thing is really, for all intents and purposes, the same. Now, presently, the buildings are used, as you all know. People come to the house, they visit the site, they want to see the gardens, the house, the collection. And all of that is supported by very simple facilities in the farmyard. And that's worked pretty well up to now. I've been looking at the condition of these buildings over the last 11 years now, and I've seen them gradually deteriorating. A uh, number of problems were identified when I did my first quinquennial inspection 10 years ago, and those have carried on in the same vein. We've really got some fairly common problems as well as a lot of individual ones around the site. I don't want to get into detail about that, but just to say that roofs, this is a slate one on the, the buyer by the granary on, on the left-hand side there, that's collapsing much more dramatically than this slide shows. But other roofs, the stone tile roofs around the site, are failing as they begin to slip away and leak. And in some cases where they suffer from movements and weaknesses developing in the timber structure below. The picture on the right is a little microcosm, really, of the general problems that's happening to envelopes. The, the lovely masonry there with its, its buttered mortar is generally OK, and it's lasted all of these years. It's doing pretty well, but it is getting threadbare in many places. Mortar is softening, it's falling out. A lot of it's been repatched with cement, which is entirely inappropriate. And the walls are losing some of their cohesive quality. And that means that the weaknesses in overall structure, as roofs move and as um, free-end walls, particularly near big doorways, are, are prone to, to movement, that, that, that is increasing. And this window, which is on the back of the manor itself, shows a lot about what's happening there. You've got that masonry I just talked about. The timber lintel, we suspect, behind the label on the window is softening, deflecting slightly. That allows the wall to belly out. We're going to have to put a lot more reinforcement as well as reimport, um, um, as well as repointing into some areas of the walls. Also on that window, you can see the window um, is splinted. The left hand mullion is splinted with a piece of iron that's done a lovely job but is now rusting away. And the window needs repair and the mullions need repair, and so it goes on. There's a fair amount of that kind of thing to do. So it seems a very opportune time for the society to fulfil its ambition to um, develop all ideas about the different interpretation and education activities that Peter has just talked about, and um, to do that comprehensively with, inevitably, the upgrading of the facilities. And what will be happening now is that there will be alterations, alterations of a fairly small kind in some places where we're just making a good background for the things that Peter talked about, other places where we're providing new um, accommodation for the important activities around teaching and school visits and the education that's going to be um, greatly increased, um, and the general addition of worthwhile toilets, um, increased kitchen and cafe, um, new services and a whole new drainage scheme. And we're working at present towards planning and listed building consent applications for the end of January that will show all of this and that should lead into a scheme of development and gradual development of details um, and pulling together of all ideas that leads to a phased construction programme running from 2019 through to the autumn of 2021. That's the farmyard 100 years ago or so. 
Now, obviously, the whole place is going to change. The, it, it's not a farmyard anymore, or rather it is a farmyard, but not working as a farm. Things are going to have to change, but there's a robustness and a simplicity to the farmyard and the buildings in it that should be able to stay. We expect it to be, to, to be kept, and, the, and we, we maintain that feel about it. Um, it's probably a sign of success that over recent decades, the... Uh, the, her the herds of tourists who've come have been well accommodated, well sheltered, well watered and well fed from the farmyard. So maybe it isn't that different from what was going on before. We're hoping to keep that idea going, um, but that, that, that will be, that will be pre preserved, the whole sense of the farmyard. Um, having said that, we know that changes are going to come and there, there needs to be a number of really careful assessments made we know that Morris was here for 25 years, as Peter said. A lot of the ideas that he developed, a lot of the ideas we now take for granted, came from his constant assessment and view of this building, which inspired him so much. He developed so many ideas about art, conservation in particular, and the human condition here and we need to be wary of all sorts of characteristics that we would remove subtle things in the, in the, in the, the buildings that we need to be sure don't get removed as part of this work. Um, a very obvious one, which we're doing on his behalf, is the car parking. Now, Morris just missed cars. He died just before it all started. Um, but I think from all points of view, um, safety, ecological considerations, pollution, the noise factor, the nuisance of cars coming to visit Kelmscott, going through what is essentially a quiet village. All these things need to be addressed. So the car parking is being um, moved away from the site altogether and it will now go into an area at that end of the village where there will be space for three coaches to be parked and more overflow parking all in the same area and that means that everybody goes to the manor <coughs> by walking it. That means they will get themselves slowed down to the pace of village life before they get there. Uh, they'll be able to see other important and interesting things in the village that relate to Kelmscott and the village, uh, sorry, and, and, the, and the estate. And they will also um, be able to sense what this place means in its wider context and in the village. And it does mean greater sanity for everybody in the village. These are quite simple vernacular buildings. Morris saw how important they were. They're nothing more in a way than local materials fashioned into somewhere to live, somewhere to work. And yet over hundreds of years, this country has developed very beautiful arrangements across the country, widely seen as, as very special. And Morris's understanding of that is important here. These are simple buildings. They're simple and they're honest buildings. And this shot, which has actually got Morris in the corner there, says a lot about the incredible form, um, artistry, the, um, the sophistication of what all of this can produce. But they're not grand buildings. What we don't need is a grandiose scheme, and we're all very mindful that we should be making here something that is a true Kelmscott that people can visit, and not just another one of those visitor centres that happens to have a Kelmscott label on it. The attics again. Um, Morris understood um, and indeed built into the manifesto for SPAB in 1877 how important it was that buildings should survive in every way, that it's not just a matter of preserving the architecture, they have distortions in time, they have um, changes to their look, they have dents, they have a patina and he applauded that and saw it as every bit as important in understanding what they were about 
and what was worth conserving, and that that was all beauty in, it, in its own right. And that, again, is something that must be held on to here of all places. And the attics, which have undergone a huge amount of work because of the dire um, condition they were in in the 60s, as Peter said, there's something slightly missing now from the sense of them which we hope to retrieve. And, and I'm hoping that the way that we readdress the um, layout of services in those rooms and the way that we decorate them will add something of the original flavour back again. In other parts of the site, we have wonderful old roofs still with that patina, and we have to be very careful about keeping it in the future. There will also be some retrieval of elements lost. Some of those talked about by Peter again. There's the bits of panelling in the house. Um, there are windows to be blocked that were unfortunately placed in the 1950s, I think, to make bathroom in the house. And there are slightly bigger ones like the stable doors here, which have been infilled, perhaps partly to support the collapsing um, beam above, and that can be turned back <coughs> into the open stable doors um, that they always used to be. Some of those changes have started when the building flooded in 2007. Um, the green room floor was so severely damaged by the flooding. It was a 1960s softwood floor in very bad condition because of the in incipient damp underneath it. We were able to carry out a scheme of French drain around the outside of the building and we built a new insulated lime floor, um, lime mortar floor of the, we felt, the right kind of feel using the local aggregates and making a much more durable but at the same time um, clearly new floor. Um, there will be other things happening to rooms like the green room when we also consider putting back petitions that have been lost. Um, interestingly, um, I came across during survey work this, I don't know if you can see it there, there's, a, there's an arts and craft fence down through the middle there with white paint on it which I just feel has got to be um, something that Morris did. Um, it, there's a chunk of it sitting in the back of one of the barns and I think it probably came from um, the, s the west side of the main garden um, where now a um, fairly straightforward steel fence exists and, and we would like to see things like that going back obviously. Now to just deal with the overall site, again I don't want to do a lot of detail on this because it, it just gets um, too complex, but people will come down from the car park um, down the road here and they will get to this point by the South Road barn and there they can enter the site having gone past the famous view down to the manor there, they can come back to the South Road barn and go through it, the big doors. Um, to enter the site, the counter there for reception and um, um, some interpretation. We're also talking about putting a new build there where the shelter was that I showed on the first image. We will be increasing the cafe and kitchen facilities in this, this won't stay still, in the stable here. Um, no, it's just not going there. Um, and then We've got farmyard between those buildings. We've got rickyard here. No, it won't stay still. There's the rickyard beyond and um, the granary there, which is the shop. And out over on the left-hand side, we've got the field barn, um, which is tumbling down, but a beautiful, untouched, complete 17th century framed building, all the old fr elm framing still in, um, coping with the loads on it. Um, and those are the buildings that we're essentially dealing with. <coughs> the house itself is in obviously fairly good condition overall after the 1960s phase of work, but there are problems occurring to gutters. They're all beginning to leak badly now. We've got the parapet gutters in some places um, tend to back water into the attics when um, the water gets too deep when there's ice around um, and some work needs to be done there as well as high level works on the walls to do that kind of reinforcement that we were talking about. On the right hand side you see the 
um, restoration block, as it were, bad word in this context, but the, the late 17th century uh, block, which is the white room and the tapestry room, and there we have quite a bit of that bellying of the, of the masonry that's been talked about, as well as big shear lines and cracks developing up through the windows. So there's a project there to support the walls while we replace and repair a lot of the stonework. Inside the building, um, the attics you can see at the top. On the middle floor, on the first floor, we are taking up the space that had been made into a flat in previous years, opening that back up and dividing it in a way um, more redolent of the 17th century arrangement, but that does give a lot of space now for um, the extra functions that Peter talked about. There's the cheese room alongside where um, various bits of research can be done. There's more scope for displaying things and um, a little research room as well. Uh, around the building generally we're talking about things like the little bits of panelling being reinstated, there's conservation to fireplaces, repairs of various floors, um, and the reinstatement of petitions where on the earlier 17th century rooms which face to the left on the ground floor there. Those are the squarish rooms of the 17th century. In the late 17th century closets were added to them as separate little rooms and at some point they've been opened up and by getting petitions back there we make more rooms for cu curatorial activities and storage but also make the rooms back to the logic that was there um, after the late 17th century changes. South Road Barn, which is a thrashing barn, opposing large doors. This is the building that suffers the most from those um, structural deficiencies we talked about. And I think <coughs> you can see there on the, the bottom long section just how far the walls are tipping out. That's accurate digital survey. They are really alarmingly out. Um, an attempt has been made to restrain them. Um, our engineer tells us that's not working terribly well and they need refixing in a more robust way. That will happen. Um, and then there's various bits of repair to the walls to get the envelope back together. Now this becomes the reception, this becomes where people arrive, they get a strong sense of the farmyard and the nature of the buildings from this building which is very simply um, altered only by making the doors work in a more effective way and building in desk um, and various elements for um, the interpretation. There will also be um, in the area that is the ostler's cottage, that is the bit that juts out towards the bottom, we're able to make a new toilet accommodation much more extensively than we um, and discreetly than the present um, toilets. On the stable barn, which is the present cafe, as I said, we'd open up these doors. You can see the tie rod end plates coming through on the elevation there. There's been a lot of trouble. This roof is really pushing the walls around and we need to <coughs> stabilise it. And the roof on the right is the original format. It's the 17th century design, but a lot of the timbers have been replaced um, with much weaker ones. The purlins are all suffering and um, the ceilings have been collapsing, as far as I can remember, a, a good five years and everything's been underdrawn with um, very simple boarding to stop that landing on people. So it's a very thorough job to do here on the roofs, which will give us the chance to get insulation in there <coughs> at the same time. Um, that one is the plan of the cafe, and again you can see with the plan on the left hand side there, the major room is the old stable space. That will have its doors reopened, and that becomes the new cafe, which is no, no longer subdivided with the servery in it. And the bit at the bottom, which is the um, um, agricultural workers' accommodation bit uh, with a hayloft above, that now takes on a much more efficient kitchen space. And that helps, again, to clarify the original spaces and what they were about, which will make the sense of the farm spaces um, um, able to continue in, 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 a, in, a, in a very understandable uh, and simple way. Now this is um, the f a photograph in the, from the late 19th century of that buyer that I mentioned across the farmyard and we're taking this as a starting point for the new education building 
We're developing the design partly through models, as you can see on the other side there. And we're trying to make something, it's, it's got a lot of work to do this thing, um, and it's a new building in this context. We're hoping to borrow an awful lot of the sense of framing that comes from so many of the other buildings and make something at once exciting and very intimate um, which will have at the same time huge flexibility. It can open itself right up by sliding walls and opening doors to be almost a shelter on hot days that people can use in a, in a very general way. There will be other times where it's a classroom, it might have an artist in residence, it might have exhibitions. We need to work through all of the possibilities and make something that becomes a really enticing contraption that people can use here um, and, and use in, in many interesting ways. And that's the field barn out in the fields there, which is um, well away from the rest, but it would make a wonderful, um, slightly separate um, field activities centre. It will have something, you can see from the photograph on the right, something of the kinds of qualities that I've just described for um, our hopes for the new building. And that, fully repaired, um, will make another exciting place for people visiting the site to use as a base as they, as they get a wider knowledge of it all. And we're bound to be asking all the way through, and I think we should, what would he make of it? Um, it's, it's hard to know. I'm sure that there's an awful lot about modern life that he would absolutely deplore. I think it's also true that the validity of his teaching and his views is so well respected and becoming so relevant on so many fronts that perhaps we can assume that he might not be disappointed with the fact that so many people still want to come to Colmscott and understand what it's all about. Thank you. Um, and I'd just like to remind people that fundamental to the vision that we've talked about tonight is the fact that Morris was an antiquary and he was a fellow of this society. And I'll just remind you what the principal aim or principal objective of this society is. And one which he subscribed to is the encouragement, advancement and furtherance of the study and knowledge of the antiquities and history of this and other countries. And so many fellows come up to me and say, I love Kelmscott because of Morris. Equally, there's a large number of fellows come up to me and say, there's that Morris house bringing down the society again. What have we got it for? Well, Kelmscott does not bring down the society financially. It breaks even. Okay? It covers its costs, apart from large capital costs. And we are securing, in the process of securing, 4.7 million from the Heritage Lottery Fund to do the works that we are talking about, plus another 1.5 million match funding. It does not bring the society down. Equally, to pick up Peter's thread, for many of the 50 years, 50 plus years we've hold, held it, it's fulfilled our public engagement obligation as a charity. But I would suggest it only very rarely meets our primary objective as a learned society. And that is the obligation I've just written, uh, read out to you. And what our vision seeks to do is bring the, the, the vision which is at the heart of the society which Morris signed up to, that's the advancements of the study of the antiquities of this and other countries, back into Kelmscott, but through Morris as the antiquary, while still maintaining the wonderful, wonderful place that it is. How many of you have actually been to Kelmscott? Great. How many of you haven't? Come on, don't be ashamed. Uh, not, not so much. That's good, because all, all the Kelmscott fans are all in tonight. <laughs> um, you should be in my office some days. Um, so I'm going, just going to play you a short film now. Um, this was made... For the, this cable... Uh, the generous uh, contribution of our fellow Geoffrey Bond. And uh, I'm showing it because it gives a sense of the scale of the estate. We own 12 and a half acres. The haystack, I'd love to create some haystacks back out on Reefham's Meadow, right down by the Thames. Big, huge water meadow that we own, and the public don't go out into anymore. 
but part of this project would seek to open up our landscape and let our public go out and explore our wonderful estate. Um, so this shows the extent of it, but I'm afraid it also is a funding film. And I know many people in this room tonight have given generously to the campaign. Please, please, those of you who haven't, please help us. And if you've got friends who are in any way interested in the past, or Morris or Kelmscott, please tell them about this project because we need all the help we can get. So I'll just show the film. <laughs> 